So welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today with you. Um, I want to ask you to um, focus on the, what I'm saying and not about the people involved. In other words, I'm going to be talking about my department and what I'm going to say <coughs> is not an indictment of my department, my colleagues, but I think very often when we talk about racism, we talk about it over there, some other place, SFU, you know, uh, the States, Montreal, McGill, but never at UBC. So what I'm trying to do here is, I mean, this could be your department, it could be my department, it happens to be my department, and I, I want to make it clear that, um, that I have a lot of love and respect for my colleagues. However, I do believe that UBC can be a better place than it is right now. So I just, just if we can agree on that. Oh, so this is the... I should have figured out how to use this before, but um, I guess it just go like that, do I? <coughs> Hmm. Going backwards. Oh, backwards? Do I have it upside down? Yep. Oh. <coughs> okay. So, um, <coughs> Sarah Ahmed says, to account for racism is to offer a different account of the world. Um, this uh, is, is a kind of a messy collage. I, I could have worked on it a bit longer, but it would have taken me another afternoon. <laughs> so, um, but what, what I'm trying to show here is that um, d recent events in this university. Well, Racism and Sexism in the University is a book that came out in 1996. Some of you may know the book about the political science affair um, uh, at UBC. But um, I did put the president up there, former president, uh, because for me he represents uh, there are a number of things. But since I've been at UBC, uh, since 2010, I've seen a dean of color, a director of color, a department head of color, and the president resign before their time. So I, I, I think we can think about those things. Also, I wanted to put up uh, this, it's not a very good photograph, it was taken about five in the evening, a Black Lives Matter poster that was put on the office of the president on November 27th. And, uh, and the UBC students of color have been very, very active uh, in terms of addressing issues of alienation in this university. <coughs> So, I'll, I'll begin. This is Canada. We don't talk about race here. This was the response of a facilitator to my mention of race during a conflict resolution workshop for new department heads at UBC. She might have thought I was American because I had recently returned to Canada from the United States and I had given some examples from my American experience. <coughs> We don't talk about race, but as Francis Henry and colleagues write, systemic racism is a normative aspect of Canadian ways of doing things and deeply entrenched within university culture. <coughs> Having lived in Canada from 1965 to 1992 in Ontario, and now in British Columbia since 2010, I'm aware firsthand of the ways that race and racialization play out in Canadian contexts. However, I've been disappointed, but not surprised, at the lack of engagement with race at this institution almost 20 years after my return to Canada. Regardless of the facilitator's beliefs, research suggests, as David Gilborn writes, that far from being immune from the wider forces that create and sustain race inequalities in society, 
institutions of higher education are especially prone to reproducing those inequalities beneath a facade of meritocracy and colorblindness. Speaking of colorblindness, my glasses are so filthy, I can't see a dime. <laughs> Thank God I rehearsed this, I couldn't know what I'm saying. Daryl Wing soon notes that the research on race shows that white people experience themselves as good, moral, and decent human beings who would never intentionally hurt or discriminate against others. Indeed, I'm interested in how academic colleagues whom I find affable and intelligent and who espouse ideals of social justice seem to have little, if any, consciousness of the ways their attitudes and behaviors are interpreted as racist by people of color or how the system of white supremacy performs its work. In this talk, I reflect upon my experiences as a black woman department head from 2010 to 2013. This discussion is not intended to be an indictment of my, of my colleagues, as I said earlier, but rather an attempt to qualitatively examine one woman's life in the context of and against the research literature. This is indeed a critical moment in Canadian research on race. Significant volumes have examined race and racialization in the university. And many of these investigations provide, well, they all provide concrete data on a national level of institutional barriers and daily experiences that affect the lives and careers of racialized faculty and ultimately affect the entire campus population. Such research helps eradicate notions that racialized faculty members' experiences are just unfortunate incidents. We in the university are adept at patting ourselves on the back and telling ourselves what we want to hear. We're so diverse. We have more indigenous faculty than University X or University Y. We especially welcome visible minorities. The difficult and unpleasant issues remain unaddressed. What does it mean to work in an environment where we can't talk about race? But we also believe that we especially welcome applications from visible minorities. When I lived in the United States, my American friends would marvel at the required equity statement included in every job advertisement. It seemed to them to evoke the idea of Canada as this wondrous, multiculturally harmonious place without discrimination. So I chose this epithet in my title because every one of my job applications from interview through negotiation and beyond at some point was embroiled in race and racialization. I'm not going to talk really about the um, theoretical aspects uh, too much here, uh, but I just want to kind of let you know that I'm drawing from this is an autoethnographic <coughs> piece of work, and I'm drawing from critical race studies and black feminisms. I do work in life history, so this is an autoethnographic piece that I'm doing here. Um, <coughs> for black women and black <laughs> academics generally, but I could say for black women, the question how to engage critically regarding, the, regarding workplace events without seeming to indict our often more powerful and well-connected con colleagues always lurks, often preventing us from, freely op from openly writing about situations worthy of examination. The mere mention of race or racism, highly contested and controversial, incites particular responses when coming from a racialized body. <coughs> We're already in tenuous positions even when tenured. Our marginalized existence ensures that, for the most part, we keep our heads down and do our work. And that could be said for staff as well. So that, that could be said for racialized people in the university generally, or in the workplace. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I am one of two black female four professors at UBC. I think there will be three shortly, um, and um, when I used to go to the heads and directors meeting, uh, there was a director in fisheries and myself, and that's, um, that's 
with a population of, at that time, 4,659 professors. I'm one of only a few black female full professors in faculties of education in Canada. I can count them all. Thus, I think it's important to speak up about race and gender from my perspective. As Patricia Hill Collins reminds us, black women have a unique standpoint on our oppression based on the kinds of communities in which we live, the paid and unpaid work we do, and the kinds of relationships in which we engage. As I said, I'm not really going to go into a theory at this time, but um, I, um, I, I, I realize this version doesn't have a slide with the paper I'm taking this from. So I'm taking this from a paper that was published in Race, Ethnicity, and Education, volume 18, number 3, uh, which is... <laughs> I just happen to have a hundred copies here, <laughs> which, uh, uh, which if, you, if you want to read the, whole, the full version, that it's there. But I also wanted to say that when I wrote the paper, I talked about three different universities because I, I didn't want this to seem like it's a UBC phenomenon. It is not. Systemic racism is everywhere. So I talked about three universities. Um, and so uh, it's, it's coming out. Uh, in another book called The Nuances of Blackness to be edited by Handel White and Tamari Katosa and I think Melinda Smith and uh, that will be just about the UBC story. So I want to talk about uh, this notion of disconscious racism and I think perhaps Shauna mentioned that earlier. Uh, Joyce King uh, offers an important lens through which to view the workplace interactions that I'm going to talk about today. She theorizes disconscious racism as a tacit acceptance of the dominant white norms and privileges. It is an uncritical habit of mind that lacks any ethical judgment regarding or critique of systemic racial inequity. Disconscious racism speaks to the ways that cultural beliefs and norms contribute to othering, othering particular groups because of this impaired consciousness. Individual acts of racism are often described as racial microaggressions. Um, and this is a, a, a term coined by Pierce back in 1995. It's become quite popular with some critical theorists, critical race theorists. By contrast, the use of the term disconscious racism underscores the ways that dominant thinking obstructs critical reflection on systemic racial inequality, even by those who purport a social justice position, as which will be shown. So um, these are examples, and I'm sure you've seen lots of these on, online, where students are holding placards, and uh, you know, I don't know if you can read that. Uh, so what does your hair look like today? She said as she pulled off my hat without my permission. Or um, another one I can think of is you don't, you you don't sound black. That's another one, right? You don't sound black, and so on and so forth. You get the picture. So let's talk about uh, my experience at UBC. I returned to Canada in 2010 to serve as department head, as I, as I told you. Before accepting the position, I made inquiries. I telephoned the equity office. Now, th just that alone, I think, is, is, tells you something. How many people phone the equity office before they... Uh, uh, accept a position. Not too many people. So I phoned the equity office and asked whether I would be the only black administrator. The person with whom I spoke reminded me that Canada is not required to collect data based on race. Race, at the time of, of writing this paper, race was not mentioned in any of the university's strategic plans. Uh, that would be the general one, the international strategic plan, the intercultural strategic plan, and the Aboriginal strategic plan. Moreover, university data on visible minorities is not disaggregated, and it's really hard sometimes to find figures. I phoned the equity office in 2014 and asked for some kind of dis disaggregated data, and the response I received was, uh, well, people self-report their race. So, this will not be useful for your research. But let me decide this, right? So, and, and so it just becomes 
difficult uh, to even uh, know what the situation is on the campus. While contemplating the position at UBC, I perused <coughs> websites of departments that could potentially be areas of black Canadian studies. I sent emails, called units to ask about their courses and commitment to Canadian studies, black Canadian studies. I wanted to know that if I were an African Canadian student, a term that includes various ethnicities and backgrounds, would I be able to find courses of interest that addressed my realities? The responses were painfully inadequate. Most respondents stated that they would hope to include such courses in the near future. Once I accepted my position and arrived on campus, some of these very people with whom I had corresponded in other faculties invited me to help diversify their curricula. This is called cultural taxation, as Joseph and Hirschfeld write, defined as the increased expectations that faculty of color should address diversity-related departmental and institutional affairs. As I've written elsewhere, black women professionals know too well how their race, gender, and class backgrounds have structured them historically in the workplace to, this is a quote from Bell Hooks, to clean up everyone else's mess. Black women educators, once hired, are often expected to do the hands-on work, the less intellectual work, and the diversity work. While pondering my position, or the future position, I heard a troubling comment comparing the University of British Columbia and Simon Fraser University. SFU does black, UBC does Asian. Indeed, according to a report by Maurice and Heslop, SFU students are more likely than students at comparable Canadian universities overall to be visible minorities. Uh, you know, there's a lot of language in there, comparable, I don't know. However, I wondered how these institutions were constructed in the dominant imagination and how the historicity of this and the historicity of this pithy saying. Do blacks feel unwelcome at UBC? Does UBC evoke a particular history for the black community? And I'm asking that question knowing the answer um, uh, as I would meet people in the black community and they'd say, how are they treating you down there? <laughs> and, and then, uh, after a certain point, they said, aha, uh -huh, yes, yes, we know. You know, this happened to <laughs> so and so, this happened to so and so. Um, how do socioeconomics, geography, and institutional barriers play a role in black students' post-secondary <coughs> access? That's a big question. I accepted the position at UBC, conscious, conscious that it is a racialized white space, to quote Edouard, Ed Allen, in which the historic and geographic presence of blacks has been erased and in which I necessarily would have to tread softly. A staff member shooing me out of an administrative office during my first week on campus was a reminder who was especially welcomed. I found myself working in an environment in which certain colleagues did not seem to care what they said in my presence. Or perhaps I should say, they seemed unaware of the messages of undesirability and inferiority that they were communicating regarding people of color. For example, one of my staff found no shame in sharing racist comments about students who were not white. I would wonder, hmm, if that's what she's saying in my presence, what is she saying in my absence? At one point, I found myself on the phone to a prospective student in Saudi Arabia, apologizing for this woman's pejorative comments to her in a phone conversation. Sometimes this disconscious racing was directly addressed to me. About a month after beginning my position, a staff member said to me, isn't there something you can do with your hair? You know, to press it down a bit. This question dredged up a historical and biographical set of Euro-conformist and pejorative attitudes towards black women's unstraightened hair, a racial signifier. Black hair has been the subject of ridicule and disdain for centuries. My staff members saw it as transgressive and unruly and felt that I should approximate whiteness and press it down a bit. In the second example, during my second year, I was taken aback when an instructor said to me, 
you look like a you look like a Rwandan refugee, as I put on a, a woolen hat on a cold winter's day. Her comment reflected the white media's construction, representation, and circulation of the sign of blackness, and particularly the Rwandan genocide. Both women's put-downs reflected inferior, inferior warized <laughs> corporality of black women, a theme that dates back to slavery. Gendered racism was deeply inscribed in these narratives, with a particular Eurocentric articulation of acceptable womanhood. So in the uh, session before, when we were talking about white supremacy, and so these, these are really examples of white supremacy, it, uh, black inferiority. And so um, uh, that's the standards to, to which we are uh, measured, against which we're me measured. The comments of the office manager and instructor were hegemonic distortions lost in images woven in the fabric of Western identity. This is the power of white supremacy. The social world of white normativity, as philosopher George Yancey writes, is, is, it is white meaning making that creates the conditions under which people are always already marked as different, devious, dangerous. Toni Morrison cautioned in her Nobel lecture that oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence does more than represent the limits of knowledge. It limits knowledge. Before my departure for UBC, a Jamaican friend with, with department head experience said to me, they're not going to take directions from a black woman. Indeed, I found myself confined, monitored, disciplined by peers and office staff alike. I was not always permitted to carry out the normal daily routines as department head without resistance and scrutiny, reinforcing for me that my black female body was policed. I came to understand through conversations with the three white male department heads in the faculty that I was heavily monitored in ways that they could not imagine. As Cantor notes, quote, minorities perform their jobs under public and symbolic conditions different from those of dominance, unquote. In what follows, I describe a series of, of events that illustrate this reality. Oh, I never get showed you that, but. <clears throat> so this section is called, We're Afraid of You, We Need Healing. To be an insurgent intellectual or an agent of change is not permitted for a black woman. When she rocks the status quo, when her behavior is toward expectations, the result may be microaggressions, subtle or blatant attempts at punishing that expected, unexpected behavior, according to Gutierrez in the book Presumed Incompetent. In August 2012, I fired my office manager, whom I shall call Betty. It's always devastating when somebody loses her job, not only for the person in question, but for one's colleagues. UBC strives to be a respectful environment, and thus there are specific procedures in place. The difficult decision was made after several con consultations with the dean's office and three levels of human resources, uh, in the Faculty of Education, Central, and um, the VP, which is uncommon, and I felt as a black person that there were going to be repercussions. I didn't realize how much, but uh, so I just was trying to um, be careful. And I do take full responsibility uh, and uh, don't want to downplay the gravity of this matter. The distrust and lack of confidence in, uh, in me on the part of my colleagues was tremendous. Clearly, faculty needed to process this, this event on a campus where people rarely leave for any reason, and let alone are fired. My colleagues' behaviors pointed to a racialized and gendered narrative in which I was presumed incompetent. In emails and in two meetings and through two graduate students, 
Colleagues press me to breach confidentiality and divulge personnel information. They ensured that their concerns about me, an unwieldy, unfeeling, incompetent black woman, went to the provost desk. Indeed, as Sanchez Riquez writes, black women in the workforce have been regarded as, quote, tokens, deviants, invisible, isolates of low status, regardless of their job titles, credentials, or competence. My concern here resides in the objectification evident in this event. The dividing practices of whiteness were clearly articulated in two department meetings in which a clear insider-outsider line was drawn. I felt war exposed in this sea of white faces. To my close friends, I refer to these meetings as the lynchings, which is kind of silly because it should just not be plural, but I was trying to say that it's going on and on and on and on again, and they're doing this again and again. To underscore the panoptic, the mob mentality, and to underscore the unspeakable terror I lived with during the meetings and for months after. Drawing on Sartre and Foucault, Françoise Lyonnais reminds us that the look, or le regard, is pathological. It subjects us to the shaming potential of the other's look or regard, and it is a tool of discipline and control within the panoptic regimes of power and knowledge. The English use of regard refers to the consideration and attention given to a person, a notion for which Patricia Williams offers another analysis slightly different from the Sartrean notion. She writes, fundamental, uh, she writes, a fundamental part of ourselves and our dignity is dependent upon the uncontrollable, powerful external observers who constitute society. In the alchemy of race and rights, <coughs> Williams depicts the injurious nature of racism by naming it as spirit murder, a disregard for others whose lives qualitatively depend on our regard. Deidre Davis contends that women's history of black women's history of enslavement grounds our experiences of harassment in ways that approximate spirit murder. In the department meetings, those who were considered leaders spoke and defined the limits of belonging. Betty is one of us. She's been part of this community for 20 years. You're new here. You're not from here. We're here for the long haul. You didn't know what you were doing. Whom did you consult? What channels did you follow? We're afraid of you. We need healing. One person even said, when I think of the leader in this department, I think of you, Carol, turning to another woman in the department, and several nodded in agreement. On the department listserv, one person questioned how I could disappear a colleague as if I were an evil dictator. Boundaries of community and belonging were clearly drawn. For me, these comments opened the attic to many pejorative societal images of black women and the memories of dislocation and alienation throughout my life. I wondered about the true possibilities of ever negotiating the complexities of my transcultural, racial, gendered self in this academic setting. Fear and need for healing evoke the notion of disease in the white imagination and the ways that black people have been portrayed in art, literature, medicine, and social science. This group of professors had become contaminated in need of healing. And I should say that there were some <coughs> professors who were not in this group. Um, let me interject that, um, oh, I'll just, I'm gonna skip a little bit here. And of course you can understand there would be power relationships and junior people might feel, not feel comfortable speaking up and so forth. 16 out of the 27 colleagues signed a letter of support, letter of support, on behalf of Betty. At least one member felt pressure to sign, but she did not. Two full professors openly challenged the group and were openly silenced. So it got very messy in the department, you can ima imagine the, the dynamics. The letter was sent to the Vice President of Human Resources and in essence was an indictment of my leadership and as mentioned, someone made sure that the provost was aware of this out of control black woman department head. 
As an African-Canadian woman, I frequently experience an outsider-within status, and I'm quite comfortable with that, quite frankly, a state of belonging yet not belonging that Patricia Hill Collins has theorized as integral to a black feminist epistemology. Caribbean Canadian novelist Dion Brand more actually describes this state as alienation and unbelonging. Am I reading too fast? No. Okay. As a black woman through experience, I've come to know that often people challenge my semblance of authority, any semblance of authority I might possess. Most disturbing is the impossibility of any dialogue around race or gendered racism regarding this issue, especially with people who believe in social justice. My colleagues, when, again, when I say my colleagues, I'm talking about them as a block, but they weren't really a block. There were some people who were not in this group. My colleagues espoused a unidirectional, hierarchical view of power. This issue was seen as a socially unjust act towards a person with less power. What they could not know was that the person in question had so much power, I could not get my work done adequately. Most colleagues could not see how race and gender might play a part in this power relationship. Their analysis was simple. I was the head, I had power. Discussions of the challenges of being a black woman uh, in department head in this setting were dismissed by most. Whom could I talk to? Just a few people, as you can imagine. Black female bodies are not as valuable as white female bodies. To quote Cheryl Harris, Whiteness is the consolation prize. It does not mean that whites will win, but simply that they will not lose. So the ensuing months were, were marked by alienation and unbelonging. Rarely did any of the 16 enter the department office. Most refused to acknowledge my presence. And I, I gauged that by eye contact. I couldn't get people's eye contact. I'd try and talk with them in the hallway, and they, they had to rush off and do something else. So. Um, others sent me emails, often reminding me to do the most trivial of tasks. The microaggressive subtext was, you're so incompetent, we have to remind you of this. I attempted a few one-on-one -on -one conversations with a few people in the department, considered leaders and people who routinely made positive contributions to the department, and, who, and whom I thought, by the kind of work they do, by their own life experiences with marginalization, that they might be able to engage about racial dynamics. Unfortunately, those whom I approached were unable or unwilling to enter into any discussion. Regarding the fear exhibited by my department members, I found it fascinating that tenured professors claimed to fear for their jobs. I had become, as Patricia Hill Collins writes, a dangerous, out of control threat to the social order. Was I the black mammy turned savage to which Bell Hooks refers? An administrator confided to me that she explained to Central HR that I had not come in angry one day and <coughs> decided to terminate the office worker's employment, that the woman's performance had been an issue for several years with other department heads. Why was this explanation warranted? I wondered whether beneath the exchange lurked the ever-pervasive angry black woman myth. Joyce King, Sylvia Winter, Catherine Lusby, and Zeus Leonardo uh, are helpful in understanding the events described today. Winter draws upon Ethiopian anthropologist Asaram Leges's definition of liminal as the category in every society that embodies the deviant other to the normal identity of the society. Although the deviant other, the liminal person, is necessary to the structured community surrounding him, her, precisely, she represents the mis misrepresented and transgressive other. I was the transgressive <coughs> other, not only because of my corporeal, you know, I can never pronounce this word, I only write it, corporeality, because of my black body, but also because my ideas and my desires to change the status quo. Indeed, because the liminal person is the conceptual antithesis, it is by reference to him or her that the structured community defines and understands itself. Um, 
And lastly, similarly, and uh, in another way, it talks about the dominant group, and I think in the presentation this morning, I heard a little bit of this um, from our psychologist. The dominant group creates stock stories to remind it, uh, it of its identity in relation to our groups and provides it with a form of shared reality in which its own superior position is seen as natural. Hence, the invalidation of my leadership in general as I carried out my daily routines, as well as the cozy in-group comments of my colleagues. Betty is one of us, you're not from here, and so forth. And of course, one of the things that happens when people have been working in a place for quite some time, they do, they do become cozy. I, I was listening to Melinda Smith on the radio the other day, and she actually talked about it as a cozy country club. You know, so we get a little bit cosy, and we forget that uh, not everybody has been working here for 20 years. My co-workers excluded me from the possibility of de belonging, delegit uh, delegitimated my authority, presumed my incompetence, and relegated me to an infantilized deviant other, and certainly a security risk. These examples illustrate the uncritical ways of thinking about race and gender. Zeus Leonardo discusses three components of white racism present in the CBC story. An unwillingness to name the contours of racism, the avoidance of identifying with a racial experience or group, and the minimization of a racist legacy. Uh, so if you look at number one, our faculty espouses social justice. However, to raise any questions about uh, race or white privilege is for the most part off limits, relegated to discussions of a few and often at a theoretical level. Some of my colleagues whose biographies and identities were clothed in narratives of otherness were among the least receptive to engage at this level. As Ballard and Parveen write, rhetorical <coughs> commitment to anti-racist practice, no matter how loudly articulated, cannot be taken as evidence of the absence of problems seething below the surface. Sue argues an unwillingness to name the contours of racism means an unwillingness to challenge notions of meritocracy and a level playing field. Clearly the case at UBC in my department. Many colleagues seem not to consider the complexities of race and gender, an example of as King writes, the uncritical ways of thinking and implicitly defending white power and privilege. Secondly, the <coughs> avoidance of identifying with a racial experience or group. As the analysis of King, Lusby, and Winter have also pointed out in slightly different ways, this sense of othering, as Leonardo theorizes, is essential to disidentifying with a racialized group. Most colleagues did not want to be seen speaking with me in the hallways, or did not seem to want to engage in discussions of racism in the department. I was cast as, as the transgressive racial other. Importantly, the denial of racism by my colleagues kept white normativity intact. Even the white women in the department who see themselves as feminists denied any possibility of race, gendered racism. Uh, and the minimization of a racist legacy. McKittrick uh, argues that one of the erasure tactics in Canada is to see race and racial concerns as a surprise, the outcome of wonder, an unexpected or astonishing event, circumstance, person, or thing. There's been a deliberate disremembering and dismembering of racialized faculty at UBC. Most colleagues have spent a long career at the university and would know of various <coughs> allegations of racism, some of which have been well researched and well publicized in the media. I've come to see that I work in a context in which it is possible to invite black scholars from other universities to share their research on race and racism, although this happens rarely. However, for the most part, uh, we are unable to see how we're implicated in acts of racial horror in everyday life. When I mentioned racism to the majority of my colleagues, 
or more difficultly, their implication in racism, or even quite simply, how they might diversify a speaker's list, or a course outline, or a list for external reviewers. I was often met with silences, denials of the structures of racism on the campus, and the sense that I was making personal accusations. I even encountered tears at, on one occasion. When I questioned the phenomenon of all the speakers at an event being white, I was told, there aren't any people of color doing this work. And we tried to contact X, which was a black person not of the caliber of these high profile white people. In fact, he was a student. Uh, but, you know, we tried to contact X, he couldn't come here. Uh, oh, the rebuttal, we're about social justice here. We need to stop hiding behind the discourse of social justice and tease apart issues of race, class, gender, sexuality, power, and institutional racism. The denial of racism, this disconscious racism, is convenient. In fact, all three points here allow people to not know about the historical, cultural, political, economic, physiological and emotional dimension, dimensions of racism in Canadian society. I agree with Pauline Caldwell, who argues that we need to take seriously the everyday acts engaged in by black women and others to resist racism and sexism and use these acts as a basis to develop theories designed to end race and gender subordination. I believe that one has to look more carefully at gender and race, along with these other dimensions, in Canadian universities in all their complexities. We need to take a hard look at how equity and diversity ish initiatives benefit white women most. I'm reminded of a paradoxical situation <coughs> regarding gender at UBC in October 2012. How could I possibly participate in the Women in Leadership Forum when some of the very same white women who signed the petition were in attendance? The notion women in leadership and gender equity needed to be complicated and problematized. My principal problem was not white men at that moment, it was the white women. Discussions of race and gender depend on whose race, whose gender. How is it that a black male dean at a Canadian university was earning half the salary of his white female predecessor? So this is, this is how we have to really think differently about race and gender. Are we willing to prize apart the, prize apart the fine strands of racism and sexism embedded in Canadian universities? and explore their impact on the quality of life, the health and well-being, and the careers and lives of black faculty and racialized faculty generally. And um, again, we can talk about staff too. We need to ask ourselves, how can we make blackness visible? Because official statistics render us invisible by aggregating the data as visible minorities thus denying the possibility of understanding the contours of the color lines. The difficulty of accessing data that document racial difference has contributed to the generalized impression that racism, as well as specific forms of subordination of black women, are not a problem at this institution. As mentioned earlier, there's an absence of race in official university documents. Even the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice on the campus is referred to as the Social Justice Institute or the Institute. Understandably, it's linguistically more economical to abbreviate. However, for those who dare not think about questions of racialization, race is conveniently erased. I write and teach and live in the hope of transformation. Anti-racist and critical work have to be acts of struggle and acts of love. I believe that UBC can be better, that we can start to have meaningful discussions about gendered racism, 
Despite structural and institutional constraints, I believe that black women must take difficult transformative stances so that the current practices are not maintained. Writing this piece has been a tool for my own self-healing and hopefully a weapon, it's nice to dream, to correct, <laughs> to correct the historical record as well as a way to claim our right and dignity in the workplace and in Canadian society. As Toni Morrison writes in Playing in the Dark, my project is an effort to divert the critical gaze from the racial object to the racial subject. Thank you.